You know, I love park services. You know why? Because I always forget the very thing that I need. So I told myself, I stayed up, like I couldn't sleep last night because I'm like, okay, it's gonna be hot, it always is. Uh, you guys know I don't have a whole lot of like protective covering on the top of my head, like many of you do, except for Jeremiah, he understands me. Uh, and, um, and so I'm like, okay, I gotta bring a hat and sunscreen. And what was the very things that I forgot to bring? Luckily, luckily, Gary Oaks knows me so well that he got me baby sunscreen, amen? Now, I'm fired up about that, but the problem is, is that I wear glasses and uh, with, a, with a, a head that now has a bunch of uh, goop on it, I can't wear glasses because they'll fall off. So I'm blind, I'm bald, and uh, we're in bad shape. But uh, I'm still gonna preach the word, amen? Still gonna preach the word. Thank you, Jeremiah and Agnes, for a great welcome. Kavika, for a great prayer, bro, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Martin and Cecilia. That's a wonderful, wonderful testimony right there. Uh, and I know that many in our audience here today are, were moved by that. Um, you guys are super inspirational to me, yeah. personally. I love our super regional services and I get to see you guys all fired up and stuff like that. It gives me hope for my parents. It does, it gives me hope for my parents. I really appreciate that. Uh, and so good to see uh, uh, Lena and his Kia. Uh, we were in San Jose with them uh, what seemed like years and years ago, what actually wasn't even a year ago. And uh, uh, actually we moved, I think October, wasn't it? Yeah, so almost a year ago here. And uh, so good to see them and stuff. But it's an honor to be with the family. Yes. It's an honor to be able to preach the word uh, this morning, this afternoon, amen. <laughs> Uh, for those of you that don't know, I'm a holler back preacher. On, Here's what that means. It means the more you holler back, the better the preaching gets, and maybe, maybe it gets shorter. No guarantees. No guarantees. But uh, let's go to our God in prayer. All right, amen. Let's go. Uh, let's go to God in prayer. Father God, thank you so much for this opportunity to be uh, your family, be with your family, uh, to hear from your words, God, to hear from you. God, I pray that our hearts are settled, uh, even as our souls are super excited to meet with you in your word this afternoon. God, I pray you take me out of the way, let your words be spoken, not my own, and that uh, you would be glorified in what is said uh, in uh, uh, the sermon this afternoon. We love you, we thank you. Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 You know, I was praying and thinking about what do you what do you preach at about after a ninth anniversary service? What do you do? I mean, it's kind of a start over. It's kind of a do over, right? Like, what's next? And you know what I mean. And, and I thought about many many things, uh, but what came to mind was the phrase: "Go anywhere, let's go. Do anything, let's go. Give up everything let's go. for Christ." You know, growing up, I, I celebrated just not two weeks, maybe three weeks ago, my 22nd year in the Lord. And growing up, I, growing up spiritually, uh, and I'm only 24, amen, so I'm pretty young. I know it doesn't look that way, but I am. Uh, but growing up, you know, we, we heard that phrase a lot. And organizations use mantras and phrases like that to help their company have like a shared culture and a shared meaning and the church is no different. So growing up, I heard it and I'm like, ah, I like it. That's cool. It, this is, this is a cool thing to say. I'm going to go anywhere. I'm going to do anything and Come give on. up everything. And then you get asked to go anywhere. <laughs> and then you get asked to do anything. And then you get asked to give up everything. And you're kind of like, ah, oh, I, I like this, but I don't like it. Yeah. And really for me, it was because I didn't have biblical convictions that this is not just three four you know four two four six words well seven sorry excuse me my math is off i'm a preacher not a mathematician okay man uh but it's not just words i need to have deep convictions from the scriptures about what that means and so that's what we're going to get into this afternoon 
is I hope that by the end of our time here this afternoon, that if you're a disciple of Jesus, that you will have deep convictions about what this phrase means yeah. to God and to us as a family. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, bro. If you're Come visiting on. with us, we welcome you. We're excited that you joined us today. Yeah. But what I hope is out of this that you will understand a little bit about what we're all about here in the San Francisco Bay International Christian Church as we begin our ninth going into our first decade as a church. Wow. And that you will study the Bible and become a part of what God is doing, not just here in the Bay, but all over the world. That's my hope. So let's get to work. Point number one. Go anywhere for Christ. Mark okay. chapter 16. Mark. Mark chapter 16. If you if you uh, notice that I don't turn in my physical Bible, uh, it's because I can't see. Okay, it's right here. And trust me, I got the scriptures right here, so and I can see them. Mark 16. Looking here in verse 15. You got this, bro. He said to them, "Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation." Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up snakes with their hands, and when they drink deadly poison it will not hurt them at all. Amen. They will place their hands on the sick people, and they will get well. You know, in order to accredit the gospel, God gave disciples gifts. We call these miraculous gifts. So that's pretty miraculous in that list that we just read. Although tongues is not miraculous. Let me, let me just uh, let you know. Uh, anytime I'm in a Bible study with a Spanish speaker, I pray for the gift of tongues. Because I don't speak Spanish. Come on, bro. And if you do even just a, uh, like a basic read of Acts chapter 2, you will know that tongues, all that is, is the gift to speak in another human language. Yeah. That's it. So though, how many of you speak a second language? Your congratulations, you got the gift of tongues. I do not, unfortunately, which I'm grateful for John Zamora. I'm grateful for Andre. I'm grateful for Johnny who speaks Spanish and uh, other languages that can help uh, me study the Bible people in Spanish, amen? That's just an example. But the disciples were given gifts in order to accredit the gospel message. They didn't have the scriptures available to them to be able to show and go, hey, this is what the Bible says. Okay, I believe it. They needed something more at that point in time, and God used miraculous signs to accredit the gospel message. This was true in the Old Testament. In Numbers 11, we find that God's chosen people decided to rebel against the leadership that God had set up uh, of Moses and Aaron. And so they rebelled. God gets a little uh, irritated by that and some situations happened, but that didn't change anything. Because then in chapter 12, Moses, or Aaron and Miriam, Moses' very family rebel against him. Yeah. And if you got family, you know that that happens from time to time. Oh, yeah. And then it happened again in Numbers 14, and in Numbers 16. But finally in Numbers 17, you can write this down, Numbers 17, verse 1 through 13, God settles the argument. And he says, all right, guys, I want you to bring all the elders of the people, all the leaders of the people, grab a, their staff, yeah. write their name on it, and put it into the temple, into the tent of meeting. Uh -huh. And whichever one buds, now these are staffs. I mean, you guys know what a staff is, right? Yeah, right. Like they're dead wood. They've been yeah. cut off a tree for a long, long time. It's dead. So can something that's dead bud? No. No, it's inconceivable. But there's God in the mix, and so it's very conceivable. So they put them all in there, and Aaron's is among them. Now, and they come back the next day, and Moses is like, all right, not you, buddy. Not you. Not you. And all of a sudden, it comes to Aaron. Nice. And on Aaron's staff, not only did it bud, but it produced fruit Woo. in almonds. Yeah. And God's like, I'm done with this. And from then on in the scriptures, in the book of uh, Numbers, you do not hear of another instance of the cheap people of Israel rebelling against their leaders. Fruit proves, a miracle proves authenticity. It's true of Jesus. Acts 2.22 says that Jesus was a man accredited to us by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did. 
And we can look through the Gospels and you can see instance after instance after instance of Jesus doing awesome things that said, hey, pay attention, listen to what I got to say, I'm the Son of God. And we would do well to remember that. But it's even true for you and I today. Okay. If you're a disciple of Jesus, if you're a follower of Jesus today, yeah. then we should be able to see evidence of that in your life. Okay. Yeah. Come on, bro. In John 15, verse 8, Jesus says, This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. Yeah. But he continues to say, Showing yourselves to be my disciples. There's only two things that Jesus ever said will prove to other people that we are the disciples of Jesus. Yeah. One is that we go and bear fruit. Yeah. And number two is our radical Christ-centered love for one another. If those two things do not exist in your life, let me tell you right now from Jesus' own words, you are not a Christian. You are not a disciple of Jesus. On, now, I don't say that to be Woo! down on you. I say that in hopes that you will repent and become yeah. one. Amen? Yeah. Come on, bro. Come on, Eric. You know, our movement was founded in 2007 by 42 disciples from all over the United States and all over the world, in fact, who decided to actually believe the words that I mentioned earlier, go anywhere, do anything, give up everything for Jesus. And from that group of 42 disciples, God's movement is multiplied into almost 10,000 disciples across the 142 nations in all seven populated continents of the world. Because they were willing to go anywhere, do anything and give up everything. The very simple fact that we're seated right here in San Francisco is because disciples from Chicago and Hawaii and other places nine years ago decided we're going to go to San Francisco and we're going to plant a church. Because they were willing to go anywhere, do anything, and give up everything. Yeah. And if you want to talk about giving up everything, just talk to the Zamoras. Come on. Yeah. Because that entire mission team spent a ton of time in their house. I think lived with them for what, like two, three months or something? Come on, John and Lori. Right? It's awesome. Let's go, Papa John. Come on, bro. These disciples were not trying to earn their salvation. Somehow feeling like, hey, if I don't do this, that God's going to not love me or, or, or I'm going to get in trouble or this or that. No, no, no. It was out of a deep-seated gratitude and love in their heart to go, look at what Jesus has done for me. I need to go do this for other people. Come on. And that's what got him here. And that's what started it all, was a deep-seated gratitude. I mean, that's why Ariel and I are here. Wow. And we're not stuck inside some wasted religious situation like what the Cardenas has shared today. We're not stuck in that. Come on, bro. Because people decided to go anywhere, do anything, and give up everything. That's right, bro. Come on. Come on, bro. Now, as a preacher, you can't just preach about something that you haven't done or aren't doing. Amen? Yeah. So let me share a little bit about Ariel and I. So we got married in 2005 in Orange County, right. on, California, just a, a little, a few hours south of us. Let's go. And almost immediately, God put it on our hearts to move back to Alaska. Not back for back for me, but not for her. I was born and raised in Alaska, and so we went up there. It's my home state, and we placed membership in the uh, uh, in a church up there. And uh, being a young married couple. And you guys who have been young married couples or are young married couples understand what that first year is like, maybe even the second. Yep. For us, it just kept continuing uh, for about 10 years. Um, and at, at some point, and I, I'm, I'm for the sake of my, uh, my complexion uh, and uh, uh, my eyes burning from the... Uh, I'm, I'm going to skip some of this, amen? Let me just say it was bad. <laughs> because we went into a situation where that church no longer thank you bro I'm good we church no longer believed in going anywhere doing anything and giving up everything yeah. and so we try to go to the pastor we try to go to the, 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 the elders and the people and we go hey can we need some help and they would give us some you know pithy saying some cool whiz bang little something or other but it, but it never was Bro, you are selfish. And you are not leading your wife. Come on. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there was a lot of et cetera. 
Yep. <laughs> and on the other side, it wasn't, hey, sis, you, you, you gotta love your husband. You gotta, you gotta respect your husband. This, that, and the other thing. And so we fell. And we fell hard. And it was only by the grace of God, I don't even know what inspired her to do this, but Ariel's like, we gotta leave. We gotta go somewhere where we, we know that there's a family of disciples that are actually living this out. And so by process of godly elimination, we moved to Denver, Colorado. Lo and behold, in Denver, Colorado, almost to the same month, God had initiated from LA to DC, from DC to Denver, people that would go anywhere, do anything, and give up everything to plant a church in Denver, Colorado. And it just so happened that Jeremiah Clark, the, the evangelist of the church, lived less than five minutes away from us. And by a series of circumstances, we were able to get connected and we came back into the kingdom of God. Then we moved here uh, a couple years after the hats. And Ariel and I were willing to go to San Francisco. And since we've moved to the Bay, we've lived in San Mateo. We've lived yes. three different places in San Jose. And now we live in Contra Costa, amen. And not nine months ago, disciples from the Bay, from Texas, from Utah, all moved in the midst of the pandemic to Contra Costa, California. To Walnut Creek, for crying out loud. They were willing to uproot their lives. They were willing to uproot their jobs, their relationships, their living situations, yep. putting themselves in uncomfortability. For what? Because of the gratitude of what the kingdom of God had done in their lives compelled them Come to go Come on. anywhere and do anything Let's and give up on. everything. You know, Jesus was willing to go anywhere, do anything and give up everything. In fact, he went to the very point of death and the grave for each and every one of us. Hebrews 12 verse two says, for the joy set before him, he, Jesus endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of God. Come on, bro. If you are a disciple of Jesus this morning, you are a radical revolutionary. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Because you believe a simple truth, that there is no political so solution yep. to heal this world. Yep. No, there that true. there is no medical situation no, or solution that's, right. that's going to heal this world. Yeah. There is no technological solution yeah. that will heal the world. There is no social solution that will heal the world. And there is no economic solution Come that's on, going bro. to heal this world. Come the on. only thing that will heal the world is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's go, bro. Let's go, bro. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. The gospel of Jesus Christ being preached all over the world that's right to yep. all creation that's right through sold out disciples like you and me mm. who are bent on going anywhere that's for on, Christ on, let's on, go. but it's not just being willing to go anywhere with our feet we have to be willing to go anywhere in our hearts come on man turn your bibles mm. over there to six, uh, John 16:33 John 16, verse 33. On, you know, the passage we just read said that you, they, they, they are, they're going to get bit by snakes, which isn't a very encouraging proposition, if you ask me. No. I don't know if anyone signed up. Hey, hey guys, uh, just want you to know that when you go to San Francisco, when you go to Contra Costa, you're going to get bit by snakes. But it's cool because uh, the venom can't hurt you. Now, amen, that doesn't work like that. God doesn't work like that anymore, amen? But you will be bitten by snakes. Everywhere you turn, defilement, betrayal, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. Jesus says in John 15, verse 33, in this life you will have trouble, he says. But take heart, I've overcome the world. And who is he talking to? Disciples. He's talking to disciples. Life is going to be tough. I'm trying to teach my son this, and he isn't quite getting it. Come on, bro. Now he's 10, so he's got plenty of time to figure it out. <laughs> but life is tough. Even if you're a disciple of Jesus. Yeah. 
life is still tough in the kingdom. But does anybody die from a snake bite? Can you die from a snake bite? Wrong. Come on, babe. Ah, there we go. You don't die from the bite. You die from the venom. And what does the venom do? And the rattlesnake, the venom begins to get into your bloodstream and it slowly but surely starts shutting down your internal organs. And you know what's funny? Actually, it's not that funny. When we get bitten spiritually or emotionally, the same thing happens to us. We all come into the kingdom. We all come into this life fired up and excited. We're giving 100%. We're giving 150%. We're all in, baby. Come on. And then somebody hurts you. And you're like, boom. And you go back to maybe 90% and you're like, okay, hey amen. There's reconciliation. It's awesome. And you like fight your way back. But you don't quite make it all the way to 100%. And then something else, smack, it happens. And you go back even, and you're like fighting your way back. Fighting your way back. And now instead of being at 100, you're at 98. And now that you're at 98, you, you don't quite make it back to 98, much less 100. And, and you, you're now at 88. And, and, and depending on how long you've been alive, Depending on how long you've been a disciple, I can tell you 22 years of this, I have been at zero Come on, bro. at times. Come on, bro. We start giving into fear. We stop trusting. We start putting, taking ourselves out of being in true discipleship. Come on, Eric. Wow. And you know what? We become the very person that we try to protect ourselves from. Come on. Oh, that brother, he, he looks like a zombie. He got bit by a zombie. At some point, he got bit by a vampire. He got bit by a snake. When you get bit by a zombie, what happens? You turn into a zombie. You get bit by a vampire. What happens? You turn into a vampire. In the world, in the kingdom, it doesn't have to be that way. And so we, we become the very thing that we so try hard not to let in. And what do we do? We begin to feed on the very heart and soul of the kingdom. Yeah. Oh, Come on, babe. With our crossed arms, those of you who just have crossed arms are like, like this now. <laughs> With what we affectionately call halibut eye. If you guys ever seen a halibut, it's like. You know what I mean? Come on, Jeremiah. With the squinty eyes. You guys know what I'm talking about. Those people are easy to catch. You're like, all right, well, homeboy's struggling or. There's something wrong with me. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, I totally get this. I've been there a yeah. hundred times. Yeah. Probably yeah. more times than I can count. I will fight church hurt till the day God calls me home. And so will you. And so will you. I wouldn't wish church hurt on my worst enemy. Come on. It's so bad. Yep. Because the very people that you're opening up your heart to are going to hurt you. But you know what's interesting is that in the church, we get attitudes about that in the family. We just go uh, go have another barbecue. Yeah. <laughs> because your brother's going to do it because he's dumb. You know what I mean? Like, mom is going to hurt you. Like, mom's just super controlling. Like, okay, it's just mom. And we get over it, but we don't get over it in the church. Why? Then we become the very things that we try to avoid. Wow. Come on, bro. My brothers and sisters, let's make a commitment this morning, Come on, this afternoon, to go anywhere yep. for the gospel of Jesus. Come on. Not just with our feet, mm -hmm. but with our hearts. Amen? Come on, Come on, bro. Let's go, Eric. Now, once you have a deep conviction to go anywhere, what do you do? You do anything. Wow. Turn your Bible to John 14. Oh, yeah. John 14, verse 12. Jesus says, Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I'm going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask for me anything in my name, and I will do it. In the name of Jesus, I want a Maserati right here, right now. Yeah, it doesn't work that way, guys. 
And if any preacher tells you different, they're lying from the pit of hell. There is no such thing called a prosperity gospel. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. It works for them because they keep getting rich off people manipulating the gospel of Jesus. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Just a sidebar, total freebie, you're welcome. But he says, whoever believes in the works that I've been doing, if you read another version, it says, he who has faith in me will do the works that I have been doing. Come on, bro. Now let's look at that in the reverse. If you're not doing the works that Jesus did, do you have faith in him? No. Now is this Eric talking or is this Jesus talking? Jesus. You guys got the red letters right in front of you. It's Jesus. Oh, bro. Now that can be a scary proposition. But he says, anyone, whosoever, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what color you are. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter where you grew up. Jesus says, if you have faith in me, you will do even greater things. Period. End of story. There is no yeah buts to Jesus. Yeah, but you don't understand my background. You don't understand where I grew up. You don't understand this situation, that situation. You know what? Jesus doesn't understand. He's like, I said it. I don't know and I don't get it. Just believe it and go do it. I don't, there's nothing to understand. God says, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. And if you look right before he says that in Isaiah, he's actually talking about his love for you. It's like, you don't think the way that I think. You don't love the way that I love. Come on, Eric. Jesus is the same way. He says, if we have faith, we will not just do what Jesus did, because Jesus did some pretty awesome things. We'll actually do even greater things than Jesus which seems completely ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> but he said it, so I gotta believe it. Yeah. You know, I struggle with my faith. Come on, a lot. Come on, a lot. Yeah. I naturally am not a faithful guy. Wow. Naturally, I'm like super Momo. <laughs> you guys know what I mean by that? His no. no. Kia doesn't even know what that means. And he's been teaching me, he's been teaching me young people speak for many, many years. Like I'm naturally depressed and down and into myself. That's just who I am naturally. I'm an introvert, oddly enough. I don't like people. I want to be by myself reading a book in the woods with nobody else around me. That's what I want to do. But I'm, I'm fired up to be here with you, amen? You know, we planted the church, the, the Contra Costa region in the middle of the pandemic. And just talk with them. Talk with the Smoots. Talk with Chanel. Talk with anybody else who's part of this group. And you will hear stories of faith-building miracles that God did to get them here. Over and over and over again. The question before us is really, do you believe this passage? Do you believe that God can do and will do even greater things through you. Come on, Raise your hand if you believe it. Now, some of you aren't raising your hands because you don't want the person next to you to know that you do believe it. Some of you raise your hands because you don't want the person next to you to really know that you don't believe it. But either way you go, you got to wrestle with your faith. Come on, bro. You know, we do the discipleship study with the uh, people, uh, and I would highly recommend if you have not done it, then do it with somebody. Ask the person who invited you here, hey, do this discipleship study with me that Eric asked about. And sit down today, it's a beautiful day, go find some shade somewhere, and uh, 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 go do a Bible study. But in it, we talk about how if every single disciple, starting with one, would just make one disciple every year, just one, we had five disi disciples made last last week. Wow. Yeah, five or three, and then five this week. Just one. Then everybody in the entire world would have had the chance to hear the gospel about Jesus wow. in 33 years. How many of you are younger than 33? 
How many of you feel younger than 33? Thank you. Chris. I love it. It can be done with just one person. One person a year. But why hasn't it happened yet? Because we don't believe. Because we don't believe. God has a conduit to us of faith. And that faith is supposed to then go out to other people. Come on, bro. But many times in our lives, and I'm guilty of this, I become the end of that faith, and it goes nowhere else. And that's not who I want to be. Come on, babe. It's not what I want to do. Who? Let me skip some stuff here. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. This is great. We're doing this all day, buddy. Do you believe that you can be personally fruitful this year? Yeah. Raise your hand. Do you believe that you can be personally fruitful this year. What that means is you go share your faith with somebody. That conduit doesn't stop with you. You go find somebody who's a non-Christian. You say, let me share with you what Jesus has done in my life. Come and study the Bible. You study the Bible with that person. The Holy Spirit does some crazy things in their life. And you go, oh my gosh, I don't even know what to do. And then you go baptize that person. That's what it means to be personally fruitful. How many of you believe you can do that? in the next three months of 2021. Oh, yeah. Let's go. Whether or not you will is going to be determined upon whether you believe the math of the scripture we just read. Come on. Come on, babe. If you have faith in Jesus, you will do greater things. Oh. Yeah. If you don't have faith in Jesus, you won't do greater things. Yeah. It's just the reality. You can be personally fruitful. We are a movement of radical missionaries that are willing to go anywhere, yes, with our feet, but also with our hearts. People who have been bitten by snakes but are still as loving, still as giving as the day we were made new in Christ, with hugs that are still as warm, smiles still as welcoming, and whose faith is still as inspiring. Willing to stick our hands in the gutter of society and fight every day to be fruitful, to share our faith, to tell people about Jesus, study the Bible with them, to not just be men and women of the word, but men and women who are doers oh, of the word. There is no greater joy than to go anywhere and do anything, and finally, to give up everything. Matthew 13, verse 44, home stretch, guys. Let's go. Got another two and a half hours to go. Let's go, bro. Let's go. I'm teasing. My baby, uh, my baby sunscreen is wearing off. It's another application, bro. Let's go. That's right. Matthew 13, verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the fields. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Now, let me just, let's just pause for a second and think about this. Homie was just walking in some other dude's field. <laughs> like, first of all, what are you doing in my field, man? And then secondly, like, why would you not tell me about the treasure in my field? It's a little shady, you know what I mean? But amen. It's a good, makes for a good story for Jesus to share, right? The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field when a man found it. He hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field again. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. The first guy just stumbled upon the kingdom. Many of us have just stumbled upon the kingdom. We were looking for it. We weren't looking for it. I, I, I was looking for it. I was looking for it. I always wanted to be a godly man. I remember one time when I was a kid, over Christmas time, we'd get together, all the family, all the Shram family, and uh, and I was like, I'm going to go through the entire God, all four Gospels, and I'm going to write out a uh, 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 the 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 Jesus like the 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 birth of Jesus account, the nativity account, and I'm going to try to do it in like chronological order. I think I was like ten. Very ambitious for a 10 year old. And I did it, I wish I still had it. Maybe it's in some box somewhere. Uh, but I chickened out, I was gonna read it to my family, I chickened out. 
So when I moved to Long Beach, California in 1999, I saw my brother-in-law and I saw the, the, my sister, I saw their relationship, I saw my brother-in-law in particular because I grew up with religious hypocrites around me or religious weirdos around me. You guys know what I'm talking about? You guys remember the show Simpsons? You guys remember a guy named Ned Flanders? Come on, Ned. Either, either I was around the guys that would sing songs in church and then go outside the front door and start smoking cigarettes and cussing with all the other dads, or I was around Ned Flanders. Yeah. Totally, totally good neighbor. Let's go. Jesus loves you. Which is true, amen. But you're weird. Go away. I look at Jesus and I go, Jesus isn't Ned Flanders and he's not a hypocrite. Where's Jesus? And I saw Jesus and my brother-in-law. And I'm like, Armando, what's this? We did discipleship right then and there. He's like, wow. this is what it is. And I'm like, all right. Are you a disciple? Nope. You want to be? Yep. Four days later, I was baptized at Bolsa wow. Chica It doesn't have to be complicated. That's why I love studying the Bible with Louis. He reminds me of my brother-in-law, Armando. Good looking guy. That Latin flavor, you know what I mean? Just that passion, you know what I mean? Not that we saw that earlier today. It's awesome. I love it. But I love it. Because I saw true biblical masculinity in my life. And I'm like, that's what I want to do. That's who I want to be. And I know many of you who stumbled upon the kingdom, that's what happened. You saw somebody and their life intrigued you or, or whatever story it was. And you became a disciple. Others of you were searching for it. You were looking intently. And when you found it, what did you do? You gave up. Everything. Everything. Let's go. Yeah. Let's go. I might be giving away my age, but I don't think they do these anymore. But remember the t-shirts that say, I went to blank, I went to this place, and all I got was this t-shirt? How many of you remember that? Come on. Don't let me be the only one. All right, just the old people. That's okay. Some of us, some of us currently are residing in the kingdom, and you've got that t-shirt. Come on, man. I gave up everything for the king. For I gave up everything, and all I got is the kingdom. Oh, wow. Dang. Woo. Come on, Why, Dang. man? Why? <laughs> now, none of you would say that out loud. Come on, man. I said it. Oh, man. Well, many of us wouldn't say that out loud. We gave up everything upon realizing the incredible treasure that he he didn't even know he wanted. He gave up everything and got exactly what he was looking for, a pearl of great value. We've all experienced this before. Think about a young, fiery guy coming up or gal coming up and going, Ah, oh God, I give you everything. And God's like, okay, great. I'll take that. I'm going to go do something with that. He takes their everything. But what is their everything? Come on, bro. Come on, babe. They got no job. Come on, bro. They got no girlfriend. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. They got no car. They can barely pay rent, for crying out loud. What did what, what, you really give up at, at 20 years old when I became a disciple? I had nothing. What did I really give up? Now at 43 years old, I got a lot to give up. And it's difficult. Turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. Go there, bro. Verse 25, large crowds were, crowds were traveling with Jesus and turned to them. He said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, yes, even your own life, such a person can, if they want to, be my disciple. That's not what it says. It says you cannot. That's a pretty definitive statement. So when I didn't have a wife, or children and we know what when my relationship with my mother and father wasn't that great I don't really care I give that up easy oh, then you become a disciple of Jesus and that relationship with your parents strengthens and then you get married or you get you start dating amen, amen. and you now have kids and you're like eh, did he really mean this I mean, was Jesus using hyperbole on, here bro. where, I mean, he was a creative speaker and all, but I mean, was he really, you know, 
and we try to do these like spiritual mental gymnastics to try to try to weave ourselves back where now my kids get to be first now my marriage gets to be first now my job gets to be first now myself i get to be first and the very thing that we willingly gave up to jesus come on bro we start taking back come on, bro. and we wonder why it doesn't work and god's like i'm not done with it man you gave it to me to do something awesome with it. I'm not done with it yet. Stop trying to take it back. Wow. See, some of us, we ask God for a blessing. Turn your Bibles, we'll end here. Second Chronicles 16, 9. We beg God to bless us. God, give me this. God, give me that. God, help me with this. God, help me with that. You do not have a clue what you're asking God to do. This is a super encouraging passage. He says, For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. But it's a very dangerous passage. Yeah. If I'm not fully committed and God gives me strength, I will use that strength for my own purposes and destroy my life and others. Wow. Yeah. Wow. On the other hand, if I'm fully committed, then his strength flowing through my spirit will only make me even stronger in him to live out the plan that he has for my life. Come on, come on. Thank goodness that God does not work the other way. That God does not give us strength when we're uncommitted. You can be a weak disciple. That's okay. You just can't be uncommitted. There's a difference between weak and uncommitted and weak and committed. God says, I'll give you strength. I don't care where you're at, as long as you're committed to me. In conclusion, Acts 3.19 says, Repent then and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, and that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. We looked at three phrases today. Go anywhere, do anything, give up everything. Go anywhere. Maybe today God has called you to go somewhere. Come on, bro. Maybe with your feet, maybe with your heart. Maybe you've got some organs that have shut down because you've been bit by a couple snakes. You've stopped trusting and have become the very thing that you've tried to protect yourself from in the fellowship. Come on, bro. Do anything. Believe today that you can be fruitful. Big God for it every single day and watch what he does. Begin to believe again that God is not done with you, that you still have more to give, and that he still has more to do through you. It may be different than what you thought. You gotta give that up too. But he's not done with you. Go get your dreams back again. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. And give up everything. Never hold anything back from God, ever, ever. For some, this lesson is a reminder of the commitment that we made just a few short weeks, months, maybe even years ago, or a long time ago. It's time to recommit. Get fired up and recommit and go after it. Amen? Amen. For others, this lesson is a reminder of the pain of the past, the hurts and the fears and the what ifs. Don't stuff it. Come on, babe. You guys know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Come on, Trent. You're going to walk away. You're going to go to your car, get some lunch, talk with disciples. Everything's cool. Hi, Lily. Hi, good neighbor. Oh, oh, don't stuff it. Come on. Don't be religious. Come on. Come on. Don't stuff it. Get open about it. Yeah. And repent so that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Wow. These on, three bro. simple points are not new to most of us. We made this commitment when we made our good confession and were baptized. But it's time for a hard look at our lives and a recommitment to these fundamental ideals that God and his word has called us to. My brothers and my sisters, let us all recommit to these so that we who in gratitude to God for his great love for us, when he calls us, can be ready to go anywhere, do anything and give up everything on, for Christ. I love you very much. <laughs>